nine defective agreements. It's kind of a long chapter. There's some um, sub parts in there. You can certainly break it down as you're going. Don't be afraid to pause or ignore me at parts that you either understand already or that um, you feel comfortable with. And, and it's a lot of information that is yes. So don't be afraid to break up the video in parts that you think are more important to you than others. Um, starting off with what is a defective agreement? We usually start off with this concept called mistake. Um, might as well start off with the, the, the major one that doesn't come up all that often, but it's a mutual mistake. Both parties are mistaken. About what though? It has to be about a material fact. It can't be about things like about value or quality or expectation, or legal ramifications, or opinion. Those kinds of things aren't measurable, and the law doesn't recognize a remedy for both of us being mistaken about those kinds of related themes within a contract. We're talking about mutual mistake of material fact. What do I mean by material? Why am I keep seemingly stressing that word? Because sometimes we enter into contracts that have a lot of related sort of surrounding nuances that don't have really anything to do with why I'm entering the contract. I'll give you a perfect example. I don't know if it's a perfect example. It's a good example. I had a friend of mine who's into, he's into hot rod old cars and things like that. And he is into something called a Chevy Nova. And he was looking for one simply for not the engine at all or the drivetrain. He was looking for uh, a good, I guess, a frame and a, a body. He already had an engine and a drivetrain, transmission, whatever that stuff is, it's all beyond me. Uh, and so he was gonna gut the Nova that he was looking for to just use it for the body and the, um, the frame. He already, again, already had his own engine he was gonna put in. So he found one on, I don't know if it was Craigslist or some kind of one of these auto trader type of uh, forums. And he went there and the seller was telling him about how the engine was of a certain size. It had certain kind of carburetors on it. And my friend bought it because it had the frame he was looking for. It had the body in terms of the integrity he wanted. And so he bought it. And when he got back to the shop, I remember him saying, this, this doesn't have the kind of engine that guy was telling me about. And the other guy probably innocently misrepresented the information. But the question is, was there a material mistake of fact between the parties regarding the engine? It was a mistake of fact, but was it material? Was my friend buying the car in any way, shape, or form for purposes of attaining a certain kind of engine in the car? No, he was going to, in fact, throw away the engine or recycle it in some fashion and not necessarily have any value in the basis of the contract or the basis of the bargain didn't go to that aspect. So that would, that would be a mistake of fact, but it wouldn't be material. It wouldn't be why someone was buying it. I think about this in real estate sometimes. You'll see somebody have a nice 20-acre uh, farm land. It's, it's gorgeous. And the house on it is uh, really in poor condition. And the seller warrants that the house or, or, or exclaims that the house is, you know, uh, got beautiful chestnut old flooring in it. I go and I look at it and I'm like, I could care less about the house. I'm not buying it for the house. I plan on tearing it down, throwing out the, the the entire structure in subdividing the land or just starting my estate there, a beautiful piece of property. So it turns out when I buy the land, I go there and I look at the house and I examine the floors for the house I'm tearing down. And I say, hey, these floors aren't made out of chestnut. They're made out of you know Southern yellow pine, a much uh, less attractive or valuable piece of, but it didn't matter. I was gutting the place anyways. So I might argue, well, there's a material mistake of fact, but that term material is there. Was it part of the basis of the bargain? I know I'm getting a little esoteric and on the side here, but you've got to remember the term material. It has to go to the basis of the bargain. Otherwise, you can't raise it for a, a grounds to undo or rescind the uh, contract you've been entered into. So what kind of contracts can you get out of because they're defective in terms of um, some something to do with a mistake? It has to be mutual. I mean, both sides have to be mistaken. You thought you were selling me a pewter or, or a, a sterling silver um, goblet from the 1920s. In fact, and I did too. I thought we both thought it was um, sterling silver. We were both mistaken. It turned out to be made out of pewter. Can either or both of us get out of the contract? Yes. It's a mutual mistake of, 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 of fact. And because of that, we don't really have a true assent. We think we're agreeing about something, but we're really not because we're mistaken. But it has to be mutual and it has to be about a material fact. What something is made out of might well be a material fact because precious metal versus um, uh, just an amalgamated pewter is, is clearly a, a material fact in that kind of scenario. These don't come up all that much. 
Um, but they come up enough where you need to know. We already looked, talked about minors have the ability to rescind a contract. People who are mentally incompetent have the ability to rescind a contract. And now when both parties are mutually mistaken as to a factual element that was essential to the base of the bargain, that contract is subject to rescission by both parties. That's, that's mutual mistake effect. What about a one-sided mistake effect? I'm the only party mistaken. Generally speaking, the law is going to let me sit where they find me. I'm going to be stuck. I was mistaken. I went into a shop. I saw this little uh, sugar serving um, thing, and I thought it was made out of sterling silver. The seller didn't warrant that it was sterling silver. They didn't say anything. In fact, I didn't discuss anything with them. I just took it out of the display case, went up to the cashier, paid for it. I come home. I have somebody look at it and says, hey, Jim, this isn't sterling silver. This is pewter or this is or this is silver plate and much less valuable. There's a material mistake of fact, but it's one-sided. I'm the only party that's um, uh, mistaken. I'm stuck. Same as if the seller were the one mistaken. They put on it, you know, um, silver colored serving dish uh and they they don't think it's uh they don't think it's sterling silver or they don't know or they don't suggest that it is otherwise i buy it at a very good price i come home i find out it is sterling silver i'm very happy and what if they learn later goes geez i didn't know it was sterling silver i really thought it was just some uh, you know um, some amalgamated metal or something or tin i didn't know i really screwed up i made a material mistake of fact i want the pewter i want that 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 um serving dish back no it's a one-sided mistake of fact they don't get it back there are two major exceptions. Well, one we're going to go over in a minute anyways is fraud. If the non-mistaken party has caused the other party to have this false belief of fact and misunderstanding, we're not going to hold the victim to a binding contract as a result. And that's fundamentally unfair. They basically induced me into the contract by giving me false information about a material fact. Yeah, they're not mistaken because they tricked me. Obviously, I can get out of the contract there. That should be common sense. One that's kind of related to it is a passive form of that sort of behavior. And that is when I go and look at the product or the thing, I believe it's something and I let the other side know. I said, boy, this is a beautiful piece of sterling silver. Or I love this Jaguar, it's the V12 model. They know I'm wrong. They never told me any misinformation. They're not doing overt active fraud, but they know it's a V8 Jaguar model, or they know that the P, the product I'm buying is not sterling silver. It's in fact um, a pewter or, or tin. They didn't cause the mistake. They didn't mislead me in any way. They didn't lie or cheat. But did they know I was going to enter into the contract based upon a false belief of material fact? Yes. Then we allow the party who's mistaken to get out of the contract. It seems just. It's almost a passive type of fraud if you really think about it. And I think the book does a nice job being pretty clear. Now, the thing I do want to step back from, and it's right here in the book talking about the contract terms govern. This is the law if there is nothing in the contract that dictates what will happen if there's a mistake of fact, whether it's material or trivial or just simply you're unhappy with the product. Most of you might be thinking right now, and I know my kids think about it all the time, you buy something and you say, ah, oh, you know, I bought this thing and the next night I'm opening up my birthday presents and I get exactly the same thing from my, my, my loved ones. I want to return the thing I bought. Most people think, well, you have, you have a right to return things that you bought as long as you didn't damage them or use them or anything. That's not necessarily true. The law doesn't dictate that you have a right of return, but most businesses have a goodwill policy in their contracts that basically say you can return within 14 days if you're unsatisfied in some way, or you can return in 30 days or some of them, I believe it was Target. I know L.L. Bean for a long time had a long-term policy that you could return things. That is part of the contractual provisions. It's not the law imposing it on the two parties saying you have a right to return. It's just that out of goodwill and confidence in the products they sell, they want to give this return policy that the law only enforces because simply they incorporate it in their contract. And sometimes it surprises me that business do that. Could a business say all sales final? Yes, it could. And if the contract is silent, that's what it means. You go, there's nothing advertised by this one local merchant. They're not a chain like a Walmart or a Kohl's or a Target. They're just a local merchant. They sell you goods and they're very silent about whether or not there's a right of return. You come home, you look at it and go, eh, this is not really what I wanted. I didn't wear it or anything. It's basically, let's say it's a shirt. Can I bring it back, get my money back? A lot of people say, yeah, you can. No, you can't. There's nothing in the law 
that gives us the right of returning a product that we don't simply want, even if we haven't even really opened the packaging. There's no right of return unless the store contractually entered that into part of the basis of the bargain. And most stores do that, but they don't have to. Now, is there other ways in which I might have a right to return? Yeah, if the product is defective, which we haven't gotten to, that's a later chapter on warranty. But right now we're just talking about, you know, you just don't want it. You've changed your mind or you have a, a change of heart about it, or you find that it's redundant to something you already have. You don't always have a right to return. That's part of the contractual provisions. And for the test, if I put on the test that the law may have a certain standard, but are we contractually usually free to alter that by mutual agreement? Yeah, long as it's not illegal, or against public policy in some way, we're pretty much free to contract any way we want and we can give up certain rights and obligations that the law would otherwise recognize. So contractual provisions prevail over the, these principles we're going over today. Things that do not affect the validity of a contract, giving you the right to undo it or rescind it, are unilateral mistakes usually. I already went over that, the one-sided mistake. Even if it's material, unless the other side caused you to be mistaken, they induced you with false information, someone misled you in a way, or they knew you were about to enter a contract under mistaken beliefs of fact, then um, they can undo the contract. The one that's, I think, fascinating, most people get screwed up on a lot, even very bright and educated people, are mutual mistakes that don't invalidate the contract. One of them's value, quality, or uh, price. Geez, I thought this would be more valuable. I, you know, I bought a, um, a painting and I heard about this artist from a certain community and I thought this thing would be worth thousands of dollars. I bought it for maybe even a thousand dollars. I thought it'd be worth maybe 10 times the value. I get it appraised. I was wrong. Both of us were wrong. Mutually, we're both wrong about what seems to be material fact, but that's not a fact. Value is not considered factual. It's considered basically what the market will bear. That does not allow the parties to undo the contract because we're wrong either way. Like, oh, it's much lower than I thought. Or it turns out I really got something, pay a thousand dollars or something. It turns out to be worth a hundred thousand dollars. Both of us were wrong about it. That won't undo the validity of that contract. It's binding upon both of us. Of course, we're always free to undo it if we want to. We're free just as much to enter in a contract as to undo it. I'm just saying, would the law require us to have that ability to do it if we so wish? No, not if it comes to value, quality, or price. The other one, the terms of the contract. And I get this a lot in my law practice. Um, people come in and says, well, I, I didn't know that was in the contract. And most of us, including myself, often don't read the entire contract when it's supplied by their side. Obviously, you might have an argument for fraud or, or um, illegal consumer practice that they put something in very fine print and bury it somewhere deep in a contract or use a lot of legal ease that the everyday citizen wouldn't be able to understand unless they went to an attorney. That might not be enforceable. But generally speaking, you say, oh, I didn't know that was in the terms of the contract. Uh, too bad. You could have known if you read through it or studied it a little bit, and you just basically gave up those rights by being careless. And we all are at times. I know when I get a new credit card once in a while, the thing is multiple pages and there's all kinds of information about what my annual percentage rate will be, but one's different for cash advances versus purchases. We'll be eligible for some of these cash back bonuses. I never read the thing. I just, I just don't have time. And if something goes bad later and all of a sudden there's a lawsuit over it, I can, I can bet dollars to donuts. I'll probably, probably say, Gee, I didn't know that was in the contract. Well, probably won't say it out loud because I'd be embarrassed, but you guys get the gist. So mistakes as to the terms of the contract will never let you uh, benefit from that. The law, very related. I didn't know the law would have this outcome. And I'm thinking even on a more kind of obscure way. What if, for example, you bought a beautiful power boat that you want to use on the lake, you just bought a cabin on, and you can't wait to use it, you buy the boat from the other party, and then you find out motor boats aren't allowed in the lake, or at least not to that size and that speed. And now all of a sudden, as a result of being both of us, maybe the other says, oh yeah, you can use it on the lake, Mishawag, no problem. He's wrong, I'm wrong, we're both wrong, no immorality, no one was lying. We actually both believe we could use an LH Michigan. And then we find out we're mistaken about the legal application of that kind of boat in that kind of area. What's going to be the result? Nothing, we're stuck. Unless both parties want to undo it. I'm just saying, the other party say, hey, I've been trying to sell the boat for a long time. I'm not gonna take it back, Corman. I'm not gonna give you money back. They'd win. And uh, so mistake as to the law, and that's, there's an old saying most of you know, goes, ignorance of the law is no defense, and it certainly isn't here in contract law either. And the other one's expectations. I thought this you know, shirt would make me feel better, and I thought it would hang on me better. I thought it would make me happier. I thought the car would be cooler. I don't know. You know, those are the kinds of things that are not measurable. They're not factual. 
expectations. I thought the product would work better in a certain way. That's different than being a breach of warranty where there's a promise it will perform in a certain fashion. But I mean, your own personal expectations, it, it just didn't live up to what I had hoped for. Um, you're, uh, you're stuck. I keep thinking about this example. I must have about 10 pairs. I think it's called Warber Parky glasses. They all pretty much look exactly the same as the other ones, but they're slightly different. Uh, I keep ordering because I like a certain way it fits in my head and goes a certain style. And I can't quite find the exact model I'm wearing right now because I don't make the specific one. Every time I open it, I go, oh, these are too big. or These got too big arms or the arms are too short to fit my gigantic head. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to return those. Although with them, you would because they have a return policy if you're dissatisfied. But would I legally, based upon legal standards, have a right to return because the expectations of what those glasses would bring me uh, fell short of what I had hoped? Uh, no, I wouldn't be able to. I just let the dog in. She's whining at the door. Be right back. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. And now that Martha's back in the room, I don't have to hear her whining. So now it's almost a transition. It should really have a different chapter. Those are the, the basic grounds for when and when you can't get out of a contract because of either mutual mistake or one-sided mistake. But the next concept's about well, really kind of wrongdoing. There's three of them. Most Some people think they're kind of synonymous, but they are distinct. One's fraud. The other is undue influence. And then the last one's duress. Why don't we just do duress right away? Duress is the illegal, immoral, physical or economic pressure that makes you lose your free will to enter a contract. And I go back to the old Godfather movie where somebody says, they put a, head, they put a gun to your head and say, either your signature is going to be on the contract or your brains. Um, you're not entering to that contract freely. You're under physical duress. That contract would not be binding against you later on if you decide to try to avoid its consequences. Economic duress. Now, this isn't. Now, there's economic duress all the time. We're under economic pressure. Everything has a certain degree of pressure. High pressure sales. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about illegal duress, where it's impermissible pressure brought on to cause physical violence to you or a loved one. And the economic duress has to be impermissible. Things like the landlord saying, I'm going to throw you out if you don't agree to buy my car. Now, they may have a legal right to throw you out, but they're using that tool to make you enter into another contract that's inappropriate. So duress is, I think, the easiest one. The contract in some jurisdictions would be void. It's just illegal from the inception. Other uh, jurisdictions, including Massachusetts, usually makes duressful contracts voidable. Because think about it, what if someone put a gun in my head, made me buy something as a result of that? I know this sounds bizarre, but what if the next day, no longer under duress, I'm home, I'm safe, there's law enforcement nearby, whatever. I, I might find that the contract I entered into is, is pretty good. I might like it. And so the victim is the one that has the option. It's not always required to be a nullity or void. It's voidable for duress. Undue influence, one of my favorite topics. Undue influence is not having free will when you're dealing with somebody of of trust or a certain bond that you have a relationship with. And the classic one are things like, you know, a religious leader and you're a member of their parish or their church or the religious organization. If you're very devout and this person is supposedly higher up in the authority of the, uh, 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 the religious organization, you probably take great heed in what he or she is saying. And you might not have the true free will to voluntarily enter into an agreement or not. And so if they want to contract with you, you're basically going to say yes every single time because of the nature of the influence this person has over your life. Sometimes parent and children. I think my, my father who passed away a few years back, he and I were very close, but he was also a very, very uh, charismatic and a very powerful individual. I can't imagine ever saying no to my father if he wanted to sell me some land or, or, or have me buy one of his uh, crappy cars. Of course, I'd say yes. He's my father. He had undue influence over me, and I fully admit it. Um, and that contract would be voidable. I'd have a ability to undo, uh, undo that contract if I can prove undue influence. That's why attorneys aren't often allowed to contract with their clients beyond legal services. So, for example, if I was doing your estate for you or your, your loved one had died and you asked me to help administer the estate and I'm going through the probate court, court and I see you guys have some uh, really nice um, articles from your, your um, relative who had died, 
I shouldn't be able to contract with you to buy those things because I might have an undue influence over you in light of the fact that you're dealing with a very emotional legal problem or, or set of situations that I might have developed a relationship such that we're not at equal par in terms of our ability to freely negotiate things. So attorneys are actually barred in Massachusetts from entering into sort of business transactions with their clients unless they seek independent counsel, make sure they have a, their own attorney involved separate from me, for example, if I were to do it. Um, and that's a classic situation. My favorite situation I'd like to talk a lot about, and I digress, but let's pretend this is a class and this is how we would do it, although you guys would be talking back more often, is the greatest American uh, songwriter and musician of all time. I'll give you a moment to tell me who it is because it's an easy answer. Wrong. The correct answer is Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. Uh, Brian Wilson is uh, sort of a... Uh, I, iconic figure in my life. I'm, I'm really into not so much the Beach Boys as much as Brian Wilson, but Brian Wilson was the backbone of the Beach Boys. He is alive and not so well, actually. Uh, he suffers from a great deal of mental health issues and other issues, including age. But Brian Wilson, the head of the Beach Boys, went through periods of severe um, mental disability. And as a result of that, became under the care of a, um, a psychologist. And that psychologist had a great deal of influence with them. And many psychologists and psychiatrists do with their patients. Let's face it, you put a great deal of confidence in them, a great deal of trust, and you believe sometimes they're their pathway to your wellness. And that's exactly what happened to Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson fell under the undue influence of a psychiatrist out in California, I think maybe even Hawaii for a period of time. And all of a sudden, Brian Wilson is doing albums, musical albums, with, with his psychologist. Uh, and they were terrible, they were hideous. and. Uh, in the rest of the family, many of the Beach Boy members are actually um, related by blood. A couple of were brothers and, and one was a cousin. But those relatives sought an injunction against that doctor from entering the contracts with Brian for anything and actually eventually got him a restraining order against that doctor because he exercised undue influence over Brian Wilson. Um, if you guys are really interesting, there's actually a movie about it. Very good, but it's also very depressing because it's seems to be very honest. It's called Love and Mercy. And uh, I got to meet Brian Wilson once, so it's like one of my most exciting moments in life. So that is undue influence. Um, be careful. Both duress and undue influence is often viewed as happening in situations where people are in a very stressful situation or a very scary moment in the time of their lives. This undue influence and this um, duress has to be caused by the other party. So let's assume somebody is uh, threatening me for money and I go down and take my coins, uh, my coin collection down to a coin shop and sell it to get the money to pay to the other person. Is my deal with the coin shop valid or invalid because of undue friends? Because, well, it's invalid because you were under duress or undue influence. No, it's actually valid because it wasn't the coin shop causing the undue influence or duress. It was some third party. It only has the ability to undo the contractual relationship with the wrongdoer. If it's some third party doesn't, I think of gamblers. I, I actually toyed with this with my brother opening up a pawn shop out in Springfield when the casinos were coming. Because I, I know, I have friends that are involved in gambling. I know how many of them will find a situation where they find they're really behind the eight ball financially. And they'll sell some very valuable items for very, very cheap often to places like pawn shops. Pawn shops are less about pawns. We'll get into those in a later chapter, but they're much more about just purchase and sale of goods at, at bargain prices, and they mark them up and sell them for more money. Nothing illegal about that. Some might argue immoral, but say somebody comes in, and I know they've got a gambling problem. I just feel it. And they come in, and they got a beautiful Rolex. I know I can sell it for three or $4,000. And I can tell that they are you know, under the gun a bit, whether it's drugs or alcohol or gambling or whatever, or just desperation because they're going to pay the rent or feed their family. What if I offered them... $250 for that Rolex. What if they accepted and I knew they weren't in a very good financial or mental state at the time, but they were competent. They had the ability to do voluntary assent. I wasn't causing them to influence. I wasn't causing the problems in their lives. Would that contract between myself and the Rolex seller be valid? Yes, it would. Would it be moral? I would say no, but this isn't a class about morality or ethics, it's a class about law. And the question is, is because I didn't cause their duress or undue influence situation that might be going on in their lives, would the contract between myself and that other individual be valid? Yeah, yes, it would be. And people do take advantage of one another sometimes in society. And um, 
the law, if, if law is going to get in the way all the time, and many times it would probably interfere with this concept of, that we think hold sacred called freedom of contract. But pawn shops and other shops like that often do take advantage of desperate people. So the one that's now a little bit bigger, let's hope it's bigger because those other things kind of just depress me. Uh, but fraud is also very different. Fraud is overt. And it has to be intentional. Um, and there's two kinds. I probably won't test you on the distinction between the two. The most common kind is fraud and the inducement. Someone lies to you about some material aspects of what the contract's going to hold for them just to induce them to agree. They think they're agreeing to what you want to have agreed. And so there's no trickery in that part. It's just the promises you made about what you would deliver on your end are ripe with dishonesty and um, lack of integrity. That's fraud and the inducement. You wanted to enter to the contract, but you had a certain expectations based upon the promises the other side made, and they're just not going to be um, upheld. And so that's fraud in the inducement. Fraud in the execution is a little rare, but it's interesting. Fraud in the induce, uh, execution is you never en intended to enter into a contract at all, but through some form of trickery, you probably signed some kind of agreement or seem to assent and agree to some kind of agreement, although that was your never, never your intent. I always use the example, you go down to, um, I think it's Fort Myers where the Boston Red Sox still do training. And that's one of the areas where you're probably more likely to be able to get an autograph from one of these players because it's it's the Grapefruit League and, you know, there's more intimacy with the fans, much smaller crowd and things are a bit more relaxed. And if you're down there right on the baseline and you're calling people over to sign an autograph, they might just do it. But what if I had a contract that basically the contract says they're going to appear in 10 television commercials for my law office saying what a great lawyer I am. And when you're in trouble and you're down in the count, oh, and two, who do you go to to make sure you get uh, a victory out of it? You go to attorney Jim Corman and they're going to appear on these commercials, both on the internet and on television media, and maybe even on the radio. And they're going to agree to do at least 10 sets of these ads at a hundred dollars a set. Well, they don't want to agree to that. But what if I just said, hey, please sign my autograph. I got a sick kid at home. And he couldn't come to the game today. Would you please sign it, please? And they come over and they sign. But right here on this little line right here, you know, and they sign. And what do they know? The, four, the first four or five pages are their contract to commit to uh, do television, radio, and internet advertising for me for at least 10 different uh, spots. That is fraud in the execution. They're clearly not bound. Either way, fraud. Lying to get someone to enter into a contract makes the contract in many jurisdictions void. It just never was good, can't become good. In some jurisdictions, it's voidable because sometimes the victim might say, you know, although I was tricked into this, it turns out not to be such a terrible thing I'm involved in. And I, I, I actually am happy with it. Rarely rare. That's why most jurisdictions make fraud contracts avoidable. Now, what's a little bit different about that or a, a sub part of that is something called passive fraud, it's still fraud. I have a basement, for example, and say I'm selling my house and I have a, we call it like a dummy wall up just to make it, so it doesn't look like concrete. There's some two by fours that basically creates a false wall and you put some paneling or drywall. I know behind that false wall is a huge crack in the foundation. I know it leaks every spring like, um, like Niagara Falls. Uh, but what am I going to do? I'm not going to tell a prospective buyer that it leaks and I'm going to sell it in late fall when it's very dry and there's no noticeable leaks. And I'm going to repaint the wall, uh, the, 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 the facade of the wall uh, just before I put it on for sale. So it doesn't look like there's any problem. The, the seller never or the buyer never asked me about any uh, conditions like that. Let's say I know they will, but we'll say if they didn't. And I don't say anything to them. I'm not committing active fraud because I'm not overtly telling them that everything's fine. Just staying silent as to something that would be material to any reasonable purchaser that they should want to know. That's called passive fraud. And passive fraud is just as wrong and just as subject to undoing a valid contract uh, as um, active fraud is in Massachusetts, at least. Passive fraud in other states are um, less salient or important. Either way, you should treat it as being able to undo the contract, whether it's active a fraud or passive fraud. It, this is a little bit surprising. Innocent misrepresentation. The other party is not a bad person. They're not trying to lie about information, but what are they doing? They're giving you a false statement of material fact about a product and it induces or product or service or something like that. And you enter into the contract because of that falsehood. What are we going to do? We're going to let the a green party, the victim of that falsehood, be able to avoid the contract and disaffirm it. Why? Well, because they're a victim of falsehoods perpetrated by the other side. What's the difference? Well, fraud is also a criminal act and subject to criminal ramifications. 
innocent misrepresentation still gives the victim the same rights civilly for undoing the contract. That's the only difference. But we're just not going to prosecute that person because they were innocent misrepresenting something. They had a false belief, but they really tr believed it was true. And that happens quite a bit. We don't want those people to be punished criminally. We just want them to not necessarily benefit from the contractual uh, agreement they entered into. Statements of opinion. Got to be careful on this one. Generally speaking, statement of opinion can never be actionable and never help you get out of the validity of a contract. This comes up a lot in buying cars. This is a cream puff. This is the best ride in town. Uh, this thing's got a lot of miles left in it. You'll have years of fun with this vehicle. None of those things are actionable unless you can prove they knew otherwise and they were lying about it. I don't think you'll ever be able to establish that level of proof. Statements of opinion generally are not actionable at all. And that's what you often hear in a defense to a case when someone's suing over fraud or misrepresentation of fact, is that if those things were said, they were clearly just opinion and they're not actionable. And opinions aren't actionable. We want people to be able to basically have sales talk out there and do that kind of puffing. And uh, that would not be something you'd be subject to a lawsuit over. Um, duress already went over. Statement of opinion, not actionable. Uh, physical duress, emotional duress, economic duress, talked about all three. They have to be of the illegal, immoral type. No, every kind of contract. I, you ever been around someone that's high pressure sales? Sometimes it's tough to walk away. I, <laughs> I could tell you a story, but go way too long. But I, you know, I'm a sucker like that. When someone's trying to, especially if it's for a small item, and someone's really trying to push me, I just I, I sometimes enter a contract just to get the hell out of there. I do have an example from my my brother, though. Totally permissible, not illegal, but he was doing when he he got invited to get a free gas grill if he went to this timeshare pitch. And uh, if you know my brother, he can't sit still more than five seconds. Um, he just got his wisdom teeth out yesterday, and he's much older than I am, so I was surprised. Uh, he got him off this late in life, but he got his wisdom teeth out. He's a quite a character, but he went to this thing and uh, it was like a, he comes in there and they were talking and talking and talking and telling him all the benefits of this timeshare. I think it was up in Cape Cod. And he goes, look, I just want my gas grill. I, I, I heard you. I like to think about it. And they wouldn't let him go. They just kept, you know, really pushing the value of this thing and how much fun you can have. And if you're not available the weekend that you, you, you pull or the week that you pull, you can you can sell it to another member or, or just delegate it to a third party. And they're going on and on and on. And my brother was being tortured, he said. <laughs> he said to me, he was being tortured. And so he agreed to buy a timeshare. And he had, yeah, reasonable credit, so he qualified. So my brother left there, a proud owner of a timeshare. Luckily, and this is completely separate, but in that contract, because he was financing it, there was a 72-hour right to, uh, to cancel the financial... Um, financing uh process so i got him out of it pretty quick but, but I, I i mean but what if he didn't what if he waited two weeks would that be a valid contract yeah, nothing they were doing was illegal it was just high pressure um uh, cajoling of a of a um I was going to say they're my victim because that makes it like a crime. But we've probably all been there. In the old days, car dealerships were always like that, especially used car dealerships. Very difficult to get away from. Um, going a little long, but the remedies are pretty obvious. Most of the, the first four are the most common in your book on page uh, 96. You bring, a res you bring a lawsuit to recover any money because you say there was a mutual mistake of fact or it was about fraud. There wasn't a true meeting of the minds uh, from one of the uh, rationale that we already went through in the case. So you go back to court, seek your goods back, your money back or the like. That's the most common the other ones, the, the contract's still executory. And this is why in Chapter 5, we needed to remember what all those different words means. Executory means you haven't performed yet. So I haven't paid the money yet, or I haven't supplied the goods yet in exchange for the other goods. I just basically, I invoke my right not to perform. Let the other party sue me to show I'm wrong. Um, that's what you do. You say, hey, this we have a mutual mistake of fact here. That, that cup I was about to pay them for turns out to be made out of pewter. It's not out of sterling silver. We're both mistaken. I'm not going forward. That's what you're right to do. That's one of your rights, basically. Your remedy is basically to refuse to go forward because the contract executory hasn't been performed yet. The next one, you could bring suit to have uh, the contract declared void um, or voidable. That's rare. Usually we either don't perform because we haven't performed yet, or the other is we perform, but we want our money back now and there's usually a lawsuit. But sometimes we're still in that middle stage, but we're scared we might be subject to a, a lawsuit. It might be significant damages. We want to have clarity. We want the court to basically come in and take a look at the situation and declare either a valid contract or an invalid contract. Courts don't like to do that. Sometimes they say the matter is not ripe for their judgment um, and for their resolution. But, you know, it's possible. It's called a declaratory judgment. 
uh, I try to do a couple in my career. Uh, every time the court says this isn't right for us to judge, there's no one's been harmed yet. So uh, it's rare. The last one is the rarest is called reformation. And here you, you ask that the court doesn't really express either of our true intent. We want the court to rewrite the obligations between the party to make it comply with what the parties really did agree to. Courts are not in the business of figuring out what you and I want to do in a contract. They don't want to do a reformation. They don't want to rewrite the contract. So it's very rarely done. But anyhow, I think that's chapter nine, defective agreements in a nutshell. It's a little complicated, but it's basically this idea. We already talked about what's a binding agreement, mutual meeting of minds, competent, have capacity, and there's consideration flowing back and forth. But now we're talking about, well, when can you maybe get out of the contract? And one of the paths to get out of it is contractually. The store provides a 30-day return policy, no questions asked, as long as you didn't damage the good. That's a contractual way you can get out of the contract. The one the book and the course is trying to concentrate on where the law implicates a right to maybe get out of the contract. And that's when the agreement's defective. And what are the ways they are defective? Mostly mutual mistake of material fact. Sometimes a one-sided mistake of fact, if the other side caused the mistake or was well aware you were mistaken, you should be able to seek justice and be able to get out of the obligation. And then the, the, the big three, uh, duress, undue influence, uh, and fraud will allow the victim of those things to get out of the contract within a reasonable period of time, by the way. Think about it. If I'm no longer under duress and I haven't decided to take action to get out of the obligation for many, many months or years, I may have ratified it by silence. Um, but I think the book goes over pretty well. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions. And I hopefully will have chapter 10 up by, um, if not Friday, by Saturday morning. Illegal Agreements is a pretty quick chapter, so I probably will have it up by tomorrow. Be well.